continues his series with John Ronson on being normal. Is anybody ready to see some spirits get demolished? I'm in Bristol for a festival of grilled foods called Grill Stock, and in the midst of it is a competitive eating competition. They are like kind of animals, like 20 men in a row, their hands are sort of covered in fat and barbecue sauce. And then in the audience is, are the women, and the women are sort of screaming for their men to eat more, eat faster. A man called Alex seems to be in the lead. A big eater. Like a really big eater. Big eater, really big eater, yeah. Well, how, me measure it. How, what, what, what <laughs> measure you, it. Yeah. Vast. Uh, really? Because you're a slim man. I'm completely obsessed with my weight, to a strange degree. Uh, How prob come? Probably overly... Uh, because I used to be big, and uh, I used to be a lot bigger, and uh, I think I'm 13 and a half stone now, so I was about 16 stone about three years ago. Did anybody make you feel bad about it? Not only myself. So how often do you weigh yourself? Too much. Mm. I guess I'm, I'm always on there. We've got, we have them in our house, so I'm always just having a look and going, whoa, got to go easy today. Because you'd been to that dark place. Been of, there, yeah, of, won't go back. I've three... thrown all my fat clothes out now. So you don't wear drawstring trousers? No, no, no buffet trousers. They're gone. Right. Long gone. It begins to rain torrentially, so we take cover in a porter cabin. Alex had seemed so carefree on stage, so it's surprising to hear him say this stuff. Maybe loads of people at this grilled meat festival have strange food issues. OK, so can I ask you a couple of questions? Do you think you sometimes eat more rapidly than normal? Yeah, I'm a really fast eater. Do you eat sometimes until you feel uncomfortably full? Yeah. I try to be really healthy in the week and then maybe... What I'm doing is reading Alex a checklist. It's a checklist for a proposed brand new mental disorder called binge eating disorder. Do you eat large amounts of food when you don't feel physically hungry? No. I would probably not. Every few decades, a new edition of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, gets published by the American Psychiatric Association. It lists all known mental disorders. But the thing is, every time an edition comes out, there's always a bunch of brand new disorders in there. The first edition in 1952 was no bigger than a pamphlet. The last edition was 886 pages. The next one's about to come out in May 2013, and it's set to be even longer. Do you feel disgusted with yourself, depressed or very guilty after overeating? No, never. So before you lost the three stone, do you think you would have said yes to those criteria more readily? I think I did used to be more dark about it. The DSM is a really influential global manual. It defines what's normal and what's disordered, which is a huge question. So I had an idea. I would go on a road trip across Britain I would meet people whose behaviour would right now probably be considered normal, but come next May might well fall within the criteria of one of the brand new disorders. So this is a journey to the eroding coastline of British normality. So we've turned off the unpaved road to an even less paved road, and at the end of it, is Adam Buxton's house. When I sent the list of the proposed new disorders to friends, the comedian and broadcaster Adam Buxton emailed back to say it was possible he might fall within the new criteria of something called intermittent explosive disorder. I suppose the things that make me furious are moments when I'm tired, physically worn down, and then I feel some kind of injustice has been done to me usually by my young children or my wife. Like Think, what? Like a cutlery drawer with all the cutlery arranged how I like it, like the big cereal spoons have their own slot, for example. I'll come back to find that spoons are just placed willy-nilly. I can't find my favourite cereal spoon anywhere. Have you really got a favourite cereal spoon? Sure I do, yeah, I do. Yeah, it's massive.
these things accumulate and then all it needs is like a small nudge to send me into continental ballistic. <laughs> and what does that feel like if one is standing next to you at the time? I imagine it feels bad and actually <laughs> there was a point the other day when I got angry with my wife and suddenly I'm exploding like from nowhere. Some small thing has triggered me. For some reason, she stands her ground and <laughs> tells me I'm an idiot. And that makes me even more furious. And then I say something like, you don't understand how hard I work, or something like that. So it was all escalating. But at one point, she sort of looked at me and said, go and stand over there. And looking as if I was about to, like, whack her, right? Which I never, ever would. And she knows that. And so that made me furious, because I thought that's out of order that you would imply that I'm in any way a physical threat because you know I'm not. So that made me even more furious. I said, how dare you? How dare you imply that I would in any way harm you or the children? You know I'm not like that! <laughs> You're loud. You, your shout is loud. You have a loud shout. Oh, man. But the fact was, I was right up in her face doing my best Brian Blessed, you know, hairdryer. The other day, I was trying to book Eurostar tickets. I was going away, taking my wife for a lovely Eurostar treat. But it was an unusually large purchase, so the fraud squad were blocking the payment. And I get this lady in a call centre, and she takes me through the security questions, and I'm unable to answer one, right? She says, where were you in um, January this year? Australia? I did some gigs in Australia. She says, no, I'm sorry, that's not the answer I have here. You failed the security questions. So, wait, 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 wait. All right, I, I came back via LA. Is that, is that what you've got? She said, I, I can't tell you that. You failed the security questions. And I was like, okay, all right, I failed the security questions. Let's start again. No, we can't start again. You failed the security questions. You're locked out of the system. If you want to reset your account, you have to go into your nearest branch. Whoa, whoa, I have to go to my nearest branch. <laughs> I live in a country. I've wasted half a day phoning people up. I don't want to go into my nearest branch because that would involve wasting the rest of my day going into the nearest branch. So ask me more security questions. This is my account. This is ridiculous. And then she goes, I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do about it. And it's not helping that you're shouting. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm shouting. I've got to say, Adam, I, I don't do that. Yeah. I don't think what you're describing... Is normal. Is normal. <laughs> <laughs> do you not? No, I mean, look, my son is here. Joel, answer this question to me. How old are you now? Um, nearly 40. How many times in your life have I totally lost it and yelled that loudly at you, would you say? Not often, you're not a big shouter, but on the other hand, you are a big sort of um, bad viber. Right. Passive-aggressive. Passive-aggressive. Yeah. The shouter's That's the best sort of, that's the best sort of aggressive. I can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> I can do both. How frequently would you say these moments are? Uh, like a genuine nuclear explosion would happen only about three times a year, maybe. Is that, do you think that's a lot? Intermittent explosive disorder actually already exists in the current DSM, DSM-4. But come next May, they'll be changing the definition. Right now, it's quite vague. But in DSM-5, it's going to be all about the frequency and the intensity of the outbursts. I have here the old criteria and the new criteria and how it's changed. Those three sort of really, really angry outbursts a year would only fit if it included... Physical assault, also destruction of property. So if you hit something... All right, well, once a year I'll do that. Like in one argument, I grabbed this champagne bottle and I trashed this very irritating sort of wicker table that I always hated and it was always there, it was always in the way and it was really rickety. I've got the criteria here. Do you think the degree of aggressiveness expressed during the episodes is grossly out of proportion to any precipitating psychosocial stresses? Invariably, yeah. OK, I'm slightly worried about something, which is that, you know, I think you're great and I'm a bit worried <laughs> that you're going to come over. I mean, telling these kind of really honest stories, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit worried that no. people are going to be listening to this thinking... 
God, Adam can get really shouting. <laughs> so I don't what am I going to do with this? I agree with you. I agree with you. You know, I mean, I'm aware of the fact that losing your temper like that is, A, a sign of weakness, right? You've lost control and you're unreasonable and nothing good ever comes of it. And yet I continue to do it on a very, very occasional basis. Unless you're crazy, you don't hurt anyone by getting angry, right? Shouting, you know, it literally lets off steam. That's where that expression comes from. And some people end up drinking too much or some people end up playing too much golf or... <laughs> you know what I mean? And I occasionally like to raise my voice. <laughs> That's the way I do it. I think most of the things Adam said were funny, but I kept remembering that a panel of DSM experts have determined this kind of behaviour to be not normal. So it's nice to find another expert who thinks the panel of experts are the ones who aren't seeing sense. Her name is Joanna Moncrief, and she's a psychiatrist at the Department of Mental Health Sciences at University College London. There's been a tendency over the last 20 or 30 years to label more and more people as having mental health problems and a DSM-5 is going to amplify that tendency. In her office, she showed us the plans for the updated checklist for intermittent explosive disorder. Ridiculous. You either have to have physical or verbal aggression towards other people, animals or property twice a week on average for the past three months or you have to have had three outbursts involving physical assault against other people and or destruction of property. But banging um, a wall or something three times a year would be enough? Would be enough, yes, yes. <laughs> wow. In the old version, there are no particular time limits put on it, so it just is about outbursts of aggression. So what's your view on the way it's evolving for DSM-5? Well, my view is that they're trying to put in a few more specifications to make it look more scientific, but actually... It doesn't change the fact that what is being labelled is people losing their temper. My next stop on the road trip is to see another friend who shouts a lot, the Times writer David Aronovich. David says he was a very shouty teenager and his parents despaired. I certainly would have got involved in arguments and shouting matches, but we were quite a shouty family, so I was by no means <laughs> unique in that respect. And I tend to kind of prefer shouty families to sulky families. And we See, were that's, that, uh, that's where I differ. I, having come from a shouty family, now adopt the position of sulkiness in shouty situations. <laughs> The reason why I go for sulking is because what I assume will happen is that, you know, my family will feel, like, incredibly guilty and worried about <laughs> me and come over and apologise. <laughs> and never happened. And it never happened. So, anyway, so you were shouting. I would always argue back. i point out, I was actually 13 at the time, and my experience of 13-year-olds since then is that this is not exactly kind of unique territory. But anyway, they configured this as being something that was sufficiently difficult for them to want to seek advice about. So they brought you here to Woodbury Down. Woodbury Down is a housing estate between Finsbury Park and Stoke Newington in North London. Back in 1967, when David was 13, his parents brought him here to a community centre to see a psychiatrist called Dr Robin Skinner. David has been kind of obsessed about this ever since, so in his spare time he's been reading old books written by the psychiatrist he was forced to see. Not long ago, David was reading one of them when he had the shock of his life. There he was, his 13-year-old self, staring back at him from the page. He was one of Dr Skinner's case studies. Case study, family structure. He's changed some of the details here in order to... He's but he has a middle-class, intelligent family with a bias towards an intellectual approach to problems, both parents in their early 40s, very slightly changed. He's called you Matthew. Matthew, age 14, the referred patient. Whereas I was actually 13, but it's definitely the right. referred patient. But there's something strange about the way David's case study unfolds. It stops being about him. He pretty much vanishes from it completely. And it becomes all about his parents. How his father is going to have to leave home for a while to do a doctorate at Oxford. 
mother said it was hard to discuss the matter because she was so worried about current events in the world, a recent earthquake, the invasion of a foreign country, clearly displacing her fear of distress into outside events. During the course of the therapy, the therapists decide that actually the problem is not the child and that the problem really exists between the parents themselves and that's what gradually unfolds. So you're off the hook by now? Yeah, I am off the hook by now and I remember a point at which my sister, my older sister actually said, it's not really about you. It's about them. And I can remember right to this day the feeling of intense relief I felt when that was actually said. David thinks he had a lucky escape. Come next May, there'll be a brand new disorder for children called Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder. The checklist talks about severe recurrent temper outbursts and irritability. David says that if this DMDD had existed in 1967, he might well have been labelled with it maybe even medicated. But what it did make me wonder, and what it still makes me wonder, you know, when dealing with my own kids, is I am very conscious of any tendency that me or my wife might have to pathologise what they do. So when you look back on that, on you being taken here to Woodbury Down, do you feel annoyed about it? Yeah, really annoyed. I hated being the person in the family that they fixed upon to project their own troubles into. David Aronovich. Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman is the president-elect of the American Psychiatric Association, They're the body that actually publishes the DSM. This is not an effort to pathologize normal behavior, such as anger. It's only when this is so grossly out of bounds for what is proportionate. For example, if you're stopped at a red light and somebody honks at you, someone gets out of the car and starts breaking your windows because they're enraged at you having honked at them, and they do this repeatedly, there's something wrong. Okay, so what if it was somebody who once or twice or three times a year would get so annoyed that they'd pick up a bottle of wine and smash it against a table? Um, This would be something that would be probably, I would say, on the borderline. The DSM is the rock-solid document. If they're applied in a way that's too strict, too liberal, that's a problem in terms of their application and practice. I'm heading into a sort of sprawling country pile. Hi. This is Alex Trenchard. Alex is 33, and until a few years ago, he was all set to be a high flyer at Tesco. This is, by the way, the first time Alex has ever told the story of what happened to him instead. I like working for a successful company, but at the same time, it was difficult. You grew tired of spending time with your friends at weekends and the Tesco jokes coming all the time, and particularly when it didn't somehow... Something didn't quite sit right in my gut. It was somehow the relentlessness of the machine that I found difficult to work for. So if we didn't win a planning permission, we'd just put in another one. It was like we would never stop. And my job effectively was to be the person who was listening to the local communities. I guess those local community meetings must have been really stressful. Particularly in places like Surrey and parts of Hertfordshire. Posh places. Posh places, exactly. And I'm coming from a posh background. I have often found myself standing up in a village hall full of 500 people who look like my mum. And often these meetings would take place at 8, 9 o'clock at night. Sometimes there was quite a lot of vitriol levelled at me as the face of the machine. So it was quite a lonely job. And in the midst of this, you had an idea for a hobby. Exactly. I never planned to organise a music festival. But I organised an event which gradually gathered momentum, which became the Stan and Calling Music Festival. So we're standing now on the lawn of the manor house, which was where, way back in 2004, we decided to 
have a small party. There was a moment in 2004, 2005, where the festival evolved from being a house party to when it burst its banks into an adjacent field. The event had closed at midnight. All the lights cut out, people began to filter off. And then secretly, over there in that field, we'd managed to camouflage a stage in those trees. But if we walk down there, I'll show you. The psychedelic bank of the early years started playing. And it was a big surprise for everyone. It was a big you. surprise. No one expected it. Exactly. Amazing. I still remember being amongst the audience as they walked down that hill, so excited, so happy. And I remember being so happy. It was a feeling that I hadn't had before. eyes shining and it was dark but you could see the excitement in people's faces I still remember that and I think that sort of spirit of that moment and the sort of winding road that that subsequently took me down could all be traced back to that moment so tell me a little bit about the winding road so after that moment I really wanted to do the festival again it's all I thought about so the production got bigger and bigger and the budget began to expand. I still remember this moment of following the 2009 festival, being called up by a security company just as I was about to go into a meeting in Tesco, which was about the third or the fourth time that the security company had called me up. So you didn't pay security guards? If you've learned anything from Altamont, it's you don't annoy the security guards. They're always the people that get paid first for that reason. So Alex paid them using his Tesco corporate credit card. There wasn't so much a fear of getting caught. It was the opposite of that. It was how do I keep the festival going at all costs. So Alex started paying all the festival's debts using his Tesco credit card. So you weren't thinking about Tesco, you were thinking about the festival. Yeah. The festival mattered so much to you. Yeah. It was like your whole life, your whole sense of being. <laughs> Increasingly. Alex's crime spree was always destined to be short-lived. Someone was bound to eventually notice his itemised credit card bill. And they did, one day in May 2010. Actually, I was late into work that day because I'd been doing a radio interview with Six Music about the festival. Next, a Mick Jones from The Clash headlines a launch party for Hertfordshire Festival Stand and Calling tonight. And organiser Alex Trenchard has commissioned an artist... He'll be uh, putting the polygraph on Mick Jones and asking Mick to talk about his life to see if he still feels his music for real. And, and then I remember getting in and as soon as I docked my laptop, I got a telephone call from the security department. They knew what I'd been doing. I was full of shame, full of guilt. How much money had you spent by then? Around £340,000. Did you know from the minute the security guards came up to you that you'd go to prison for this? Yes. There was a sort of good cop, bad cop scenario going on. One of them probably thought I was a spoilt rich kid who'd had a massive party and just did it for his own ego whereas the other one probably thought that I was a bit lost and ultimately they're both right Alex was sentenced to 30 months in prison he served half he says what kept him going was the thought of getting out and organising his festival again and now he is although in a more cost-effective way. There's a proposed new disorder that seems tailor-made for Alex. The New York Times says millions of people may be diagnosed as addicts because of it. Come next May, you would probably fit within the category 
behavioural addictions not otherwise specified. <laughs> Where did the label stop? It's a sort of march of the labels. And I'm not too bothered, as long as it means I can carry on with rebuilding my life. And, and when that... you say rebuilding your life, does that include carrying on with the festival? Yeah, I'm thinking about the festival this summer. And having spent a year in prison, you know, having missed it last year, it's amazing that I'm able to do this again. And I owe an enormous debt of gratitude to all the people that have allowed me to do that. And I can't wait. Alex Trenchard. So the idea was to take a road trip to the eroding coastline of normality to try and work out what to think about all the new labels. For critics like Joanna Moncrief, there's nothing positive at all about the ever-fattening DSM manual. I think that labels oversimplify situations. Almost half of the American population have at least one mental disorder and a large proportion of those people have more than one mental disorder. So actually these different labels are not picking up on discrete situations. And so if it goes over 50%, you said it's nearly 50% now, if it goes over 50%, then it becomes normal. Yes. After I finished interviewing Joanna and put away the tape recorder, I told her some of the stories from this programme. She said she got into psychiatry for the same reason I got into journalism. To hear people's stories. Then she said, that's the problem with labels. They ruin stories. But Dr Lieberman, the man overseeing the new DSM, sees that view as naive and fanciful, and not how scientists should be. Which I suppose is true. But it's hard not to mourn the fact that checklists kill stories dead. Look, a thousand years ago the world was flat, and then we had exploration and we've mapped the world. And what we do in science and in medicine is to map the range of human biology and behavior. And in doing so, certain things weren't as we thought. In that sense, you can look at science as demystifying various things, but that's basically the acquisition of knowledge and the pursuit of truth. John Ronson on Being Normal was presented by John Ronson and produced by 